umbrella up. Oh, yeah, unfortunately, it's not quite the weather I was hoping for for today's live stream, but you know, make your best of what you've got. Um, so yeah, starting off, hello there, I'm James and I'm part of the Naturehood team and today I'm going to be talking to you about planting flowers for pollinators and for other wildlife in your gardens, balconies or just window boxes. And uh, so I'll probably go, be going for about quarter of an hour, so, and uh, if you're watching this back on YouTube or Facebook after or whatever, then uh, apologies if I'm directing people through things at a slightly slower rate at the start just as I'm waiting for a few people to join. Um, but yeah, so a quick note about our project. So I'm part of the Naturehood team, and uh, it's a project run by Earthwatch Europe and funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. So a big thanks to them for funding our work. And uh, what we really try and do is connect people with nature and support them to take action for wildlife in their private spaces. Because, um, so for example, I'm based in Oxford and I'm live from the Nature at Oxford Facebook page and in this city we have quite a few different parks and nature areas that exist but it's not enough for a hedgehog to have these little islands they need to have a connected landscape and so by doing simple and straightforward things that are quite fun to do in your spaces you can really help transform at a landscape scale for these different species and uh, the focus for today is all going to be on um, flowers um, so yeah what why, why do we need to talk about flowers? I think the, the statistic that always comes to mind for me when talking about this is the fact that since the end of the Second World War, we've lost 97% of our natural wildflower meadows, which is just a, a shockingly large amount. And it's because of the sort of mentality shift that happened through that, pro uh, through that time in history where we changed the way that we farmed our land and there was a big industrial revolution and a lot of new pesticides and fertilizers and ways of using the land with machinery as well. And that really was the dawn of the modern era of farming. And that, that basically started categorizing things like wildflower meadows as wasted land and wasted places that could be being used for agricultural production. And so we had the big clear out. And in a way, that mentality has never quite shifted back. And so in places in the countryside where you might expect these different species to be supported by flowers naturally, there's not that resource. And so it's, it's important for us to try and supplement it where we can. And in fact, in the last 20 years in urban areas, even um, for our butterfly species in the UK, there's been almost a 70% decline, um, which is actually greater than that in the countryside, which is disappointing because there's so much opportunity in urban areas to have um, flowers that provide the nectar that is the food source for all these species. But what's quite interesting for those animals is that they don't just need flowers, they need things to support them as caterpillars and to support them as eggs. And it's like the complex life cycle makes things a little bit more complicated. Um, but I think that something I should say as well is that although I have done a bit of research, I'm not an absolute expert when it comes to wildflowers. So if you want to add any comments in about things you found and your experiences, then please do. And uh, if I need correcting, then don't hold back. Um, but what's interesting is that you don't need to be an expert by any means to get involved with trying to plant flowers for wildlife. And so the real great rule of thumb to have is that diversity is best. And so if you have flowers of lots of different shapes and sizes and colors, then you're doing a really good job. And so actually I'm going to try and show you around my space a little bit in the rain, which is slightly ambitious, I know, um, and show you what I mean by that if I can. Okay, here we go. So, if we head over here, um, hopefully you can see just here this sort of pinkish reddish flower. This is called um, red valerian. And so what that is, is a really good plant for butterflies to come and feed from. Um, we've also got some of this, which is green alkanet. And if you look here, we've got the blue flowers, which are quite a different shape. But zoom in all the way you can see that shape there of the flower is very different from these much narrower flower heads and that's important because if you think about the really kind of narrow thing we have here in these 
that will then need a long tongue to get in and get the nectar out. And so you'll have different pollinators benefit from the uh, benefiting from these different kinds of flower. And over here, there's some garlic mustard, which is really good for species like the um, orange tip. Um, and then some wonderful bluebells as well, which hopefully we've all been seeing around in the last couple of weeks. And I think these two are really good contrast. You can see sort of the open white flower compared to that sort of bulbous bluebell. Um, and it's not the case that I won't have a, say, a, a kind of bee that will feed from both of those. But by having that diversity, you're ensuring there's a lot more opportunity for different kinds of things. Um, yeah, I'm going to show you these as well, because these are quite funky little flowers. Um, oh, no, they've actually just budded. Um, but these were just, oh, here's some. Um, you can see these flowers just here on this tree, and I can't remember what it's called. I looked it up using the sea cap, which is great, but those are green flowers and they're much smaller, which you might not expect. Sorry, there's a bit of duck under here. Um, but one of the flowers that a lot of people will have in their spaces <laughs> and is often overlooked is this fantastic one right here, which I'm sure many of you will recognize, which is the dandelion. Um, dandelions are actually brilliant sources of nectar. And because of their way of reproducing with all those seeds, they're available right through the year. So having dandelions supports a real diversity of our native pollinating insects. And we need those pollinating insects to keep having healthy production everything else. Um, yeah, there's a real variety in here, and it's not that we've actually cultivated them, it's much more that they have um, come up on their own. And so with a different mindset, you might talk about these flowers as weeds. Um, but I think what's a, <laughs> weeds are not a very helpful term because it's much more just flowers that are in the wrong place. Um, there's no real thing as weeds in my book. Um, and so by encouraging things when you've, oh, I'm getting wet now. Um, when you've figured out if you want them and what species they'll support and doing that research and just having a little bit of a plan can be really, really helpful uh, for knowing if you want to keep some of those things that you might think are weeds or you might have been told are weeds, like the dandelions, um, that can actually be really valuable. And having that diversity of shapes, color, sizes, is the best rule of thumb to have. Having a plan though, when it comes to planting, if you're gonna actively plant things up is really key as well. Because if you're gonna do something like um, buy a wildflower seed mix and plant that up in your garden, what you wanna be thinking about are key things like the aspect. So how much sunlight is it gonna get? How hot is it gonna be? Um, the quality of the soil that it's going into as well, because for our native wildflowers, they don't like rich compost. They actually like kind of more sandy, less nutrient rich soil. So actually, if you've got kind of a, a less good part of your garden where it's sandy soil, where there's been some building work or something like that, that can be a really brilliant place to put in your wildflower seeds and just water them a few times and hopefully they'll come through on their own. Um, and often those will be annuals. So what that means is that they'll grow that year they'll seed that year and they'll drop their seeds and that, that'll be their whole life cycle will happen in one planting season. There are perennial species, so things like um, tulips and daffodils that will come back every year um, because they have that uh, stock in the soil with their roots, uh, the bulb, that was the word I was losing. Um, and then there's also biennials, so things like uh, some types of wallflower, which is a really good plant to be choosing um, for pollinators uh, that will come back maybe every other year um, and so if you know those sorts of things in advance, you don't panic when your wallflowers don't come back the year after you planted them because you can rest assured that they'll probably come back the year after and maybe plant some one year, plant some the other year and you sort of get that alternating so you've always got some flowers on the go. Um, and also there's other things you can use these for. So for plants like oregano, thyme, mint, that I would think of as kind of herbs and that you would use in cooking and lavender as well the flowers that those different plants have are really useful for pollinators so making sure that if you're going to have those they're not just in the greenhouse but they're um or, or that greenhouse has an open window so that pollinators can come in and benefit and feed from them um yeah which is really exciting and i think there's also something to be said about 
if you don't have a greenhouse or a garden, there's still a lot you can do. And that, that comes to kind of container planting. And one of the key things of container planting is what containers you're using and where they are. So <laughs> if you have a very big pot with not much in it, then those plants might struggle. And similarly, if you have a very small plant with lots in it, then it might not be the best idea. So it's also thinking about the material. So if it's a metal pot and it's in the sunlight, it'll get very warm. And if it's very warm and very wet, then it might lead to roots rotting. Um, but if it's very warm, it'll also dry out very quickly. So you'll need to water it regularly through the summer, unless it's raining like this today. Um, <laughs> yeah. There was also something I wanted to mention about <laughs> if you have a container, it doesn't have to be just flowers you put in there. So a really great uh, fruiting plant is the crab apple tree and you can get dwarf crab apple trees and also dwarf pussy willows that's another good example that can go in container pots and not only do they have flowers that are good as a way of providing nectar for those insects but they also then get fruit later in the year so things like um the crab apple tree will produce the crab apples that will then be a natural food source for birds that might visit your garden um which is really exciting and i think it's great to think about things in those multiple dimensions and different ways um, one little tip I have for people who are using lots of containers in their gardens and having lots of plants in pots is that to help those plants really thrive, what can help a lot is just grouping them all together because that helps um, shelter them from the wind and having too much direct sunlight and means that they kind of support each other and it's a lot easier than sort of moving them around to make sure they're in shady areas and keeping them out of the wind by just grouping them all together you can have a patio with a load of plants in it which is doing a lot for pollinating insects um yeah those are kind of my main hints and tips and hopefully it was quite helpful i know i tend to go on a bit of a ramble when there's no one there to interrupt me and ask me questions and if you do have any questions please do post them in the comments and i'll come back to them when the video has ended um similarly if you have any questions about naturehood and what's up with that and what, what we are as a project, then I'll, I'll try and answer those in a minute. But please go ahead and put those questions in the comment section on this and whether it's on Facebook or YouTube, it doesn't matter. I'll come back to it and have a look at those. Um, so, yeah, I, I just wanted to make a note about naturehood and why we support people to take action. But we also ask people to come back and record what they're doing with us. So if you are planting flowers for pollinators, we ask you to log into our website and it's all free and straightforward to do and record with us that you're planting those flowers. And the, the reason we do this is partly so that we can say to the National Lottery, look at all these great people that are doing these great things. But more than that, we have an underlying scientific research project. And what that's interested in doing is finding out about um, in places like gardens and balconies where you can't send in an, an ecologist uh, what's going on with the wildlife in that space and that means both animals and plants and what what are we supporting in our private spaces because there's not that much information out there at the moment and it's really important for us to find out so that we can help do things that are informed by the evidence so if we want to help pollinating insects then do we need to really push for interventions in the countryside or do we need to push the interventions in urban areas and get people doing more we don't know and that's why we want to do the research to find out exactly what works and what works best but we can only do that if we're collecting the information from you and so that's saying oh i've planted these flowers but it's also doing kind of a basic survey of these are the things i regularly see in my space and this is how big it is and where it is on a map um, and it really doesn't take very long to do but it is really valuable for that project so if you can head over to naturehood and i'm sure i'll drop that in the comments as a link um, and it's just naturehood.uk that'd be terrific so thank you for that and also don't forget to like our Facebook pages so this one's Naturehood Oxford our next video I believe is going to be going out from the Naturehood Tadpole, Vill Tadpole Garden Village page but we'll be sharing that through here um, and I think that'll be another exciting one to find out more about what you can be doing in your garden to support wildlife or your balcony your window box even like today you can definitely have some wonderful flowers in your window box on a sort of fifth story in a apartment complex and it will still be supporting pollinators because most of them can fly up there whether it's a hoverfly or a butterfly or a exciting moth then yeah 
it all works out. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's everything I have for you this afternoon. Um, please do post your questions and comments, and be sure to check out naturehood.uk. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone.